And we're back with part two of the chapter three lecture, continuing on talking about how actors and writers and producers build the characters. Now we'll get to a broader picture of performance in general. Strategies of performance. Your book talks a lot about four particular strategies, and I'm gonna to try to clarify those for you. The naturalist and the anti-naturalist. Those are pretty much what they sound like. A naturalist is going to be a, as believable as they can be, as natural as they can be. We don't tend to be really loud and obnoxious in our normal lives. I mean, some of us might be, but we're not really on like that all the time. We're a little bit more subdued, and that's what the natural naturalists are going for. They're going for that kind of realistic performance. You're going to see this probably more in your serials than you are in your sitcoms. Sitcoms tend to be a little bit more exaggerated in comedy, physical stature, voice, things like that. But the naturalist performance are, are going to be the ones that make it as close to reality as they can. Then the anti-naturalists are rejecting that plausibility. They're making it a little bit more outrageous. So your big comedies are going to be a little bit more like that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. They break the, the naturalist category down into repertory and method. There's two kind of ways of approaching this. Think of it as the repertory is more a process of selecting particular gestures, dialects. The outside physical appearance of the actor will then lead to the inward emotions of the character. It's kind of an outside-in process. They work on the outside of the character with their clothing. They look in the mirror to see what they look like. They figure out what their posture is going to be. And then the character evolves from that. Um, the dialects affect it. The way that they talk affects it. Things like that. The method is a little bit the opposite. The actor becomes the character from the inside out. They think very deeply about what the character is going through. And then from that evolves the way they walk and the way they talk. So if you can think of those as two ways of approaching that. A lot of actors nowadays use both of these methods kind of interchangeably. They don't just work on one or the other. They don't just work on the emotions of the character to get to the outside look. And they don't just work on the outside look to get to the inward emotions. They do them at the same time. That hasn't always been the case in history. A lot of times in history, um, some actors felt like only the repertory method was important or only the method was important. So the method, I'll talk about that more specifically, it's based on specific techniques, getting to the emotional memory of the characters um, and the actors themselves. What does the actor remember in their lives that might translate to the character? Their sense memory, their improvisation, trying to become the character. Daniel Day-Lewis is a perfect example of this in film acting. He really tries to live the life of the character before he even starts his performance. He's currently doing a film about um, Abraham Lincoln, and he literally prepared for that by living the way that Abraham Lincoln lived without electricity and without a lot of modern conveniences in order to get inside the head of the character. So he's definitely what we would call a method actor. And this stems from Konstantin Stanislavski. If you've studied acting theory, you've probably heard of him in the late 1800s, early 1900s in the Moscow Art Theater. He was Russian. Um, the Moscow Art Theater is still around, but he was one of the founders of it. And he really believed in this method, um, at least at first in his career. He believed that the inward emotion of the character would lead to the outside performance. Um, and he brought this idea to America. A lot of Americans went over and studied with him, came back to America, brought these ideas. Um, Marlon Brando was a perfect example. He really capitalized on this. The play and then the film introduced the method of acting. And if you have watched any Marlon Brando films, even from this one on, um, he is very, very naturalist, very inward in his performance. Sometimes it's even hard to understand him because he's so focused on the emotions and the inward um, thoughts of the character. Rod Steiger is another example in this production of Marty that was broadcast live on television in 1953. You see that kind of brooding look on his face. He's trying to access those emotions and get to them. Now, this method has is, is been criticized a lot and brought controversy to a lot of actors because they think it's a little too inward. It's almost to the point where the audience can't even really get what's going on because the actor is so in their head. They're constantly just thinking about their emotions, which don't always translate to an outside look for an audience. That's why blending it with a more physical type of acting style is preferable. So the anti-naturalist going a little bit more the other way, 
Um, they don't care about looking realistic. In fact, they want you to know that you are watching something fake, if you want to think about it that way. We've talked about how the programs will bring you into the world. They don't really care about that. They want to acknowledge that you are an audience watching them. They don't try to ignore the audience. So this is based in song and dance numbers, comedy routines, short dramatic sk skits and tableau where they speak directly to the audience. They might even interact with the audience as the audience is laughing and they're laughing back. They might ask questions. They directly address the audience. We see this in these old vaudeville shows, the Gonzalez brothers. They're, this is an old silent film. They're interacting directly. They're performing for the audience, not just in front of them. Um, George Burns was a great example of this. He liked to speak directly to the camera and uh, work with his studio audience to get feedback. And it helped feed the performance and it helped kind of guide the path of how the performance was going. And sometimes breaking character, I guess is what you could call this, in the middle of the show to acknowledge the audience. This would be an anti-naturalist style because they're not just helping you get caught up in their world. They're coming into your world as well. A great example of this is Malcolm in the Middle. This is a more contemporary show where he speaks directly to the camera. So he is acknowledging the fact that he is in one world, you're in another, but yet maybe there's something we can all learn from each other. So that's one of the ways that that's used. So continuing talking about building of performances, um, this anti-naturalist idea is not new. It was kind of developed a lot by Bertolt Brecht in the 1800s in his epic theater. He was a German director who really believed that this kind of distancing effect from the character's world and introducing yourself into the audience's world was important because it helped alienate the viewer in order to prov provoke social change. If you look back at this clip of Malcolm in the Middle, he obviously needs something from the audience. He wants the audience to understand what he's going through as well, but yet he's not brooding about it. He's not crying. He's not whining. He's not pleading. He's being objective and he's being reasonable. And he's probably looking at us saying, you know, what do you guys think? <laughs> you know, what are you going to do about this kind of lifestyle that I have? And how, what would you do if you were me? And he gets the, the viewer thinking about that rather than so emotional that we feel sorry for him because we're watching him from afar. Um, Brecht really believed that if you took that emotional connection um, and empathy out of it, that the viewer would be much more willing to do something about it in their own life. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes a performance is so overwhelming that we cry and cry and cry and we just want to don't think about it anymore when it's over. We just want to go um, do something else, you know. But Brecht believed that if you can get the audience relaxed to the point where they're thinking a little bit more objectively and they're not caught up emotionally, then they're more willing to, to go out into the real world and apply the techniques that they've learned in the show. Hope that makes sense. Um, you can watch this clip. This might help define what we're talking about here. If you remove some of the emotional connection from the story and put it in the mind of the viewer to, to create that emotional connection for themselves, then that's the effect of alienation and anti-naturalism. Okay, last thing we'll talk about is the star system. Obviously, TV stars are very, very wealthy and very, very, very much in the public eye. And so let's talk a little bit about that phenomenon. The star text is really a collection of signifiers that hold meanings for the viewer. Again, here's that word polysemy, many meanings. Stars go through lots of different things. Um, we see them in a show, but yet their real lives are a little bit more of a question mark. What are they really like? We sometimes wonder. So intertextuality is important. A star's presence in many different media texts includes their promotion, their publicity. They all have publicists that help them define their personality for the public, and they are trying at least to be in control of what that looks like. Um, this is an old example of a film actor who uh, was rumored to have died. Um, and so she, she had a, a little bit of a trouble there with her promotion and publicity. It wasn't going so well for her. So intertextuality is a star's presence in many different media texts, not just in the programs, and films, but in the criticism of those films as well. Sometimes we call this a perfect fit, which means it seems like the character's personality and their, and their um, I'm sorry, the actor's personality and their character role are exactly the same. Sometimes it's problematic. Sometimes they go against that. They're playing something that doesn't fit with our public perception of what they're like.
And sometimes it's very selective. Sometimes um, they try to ignore certain parts of their personality so that other parts of their personality can come forward and make sense in the show. The book gives the example of Larry Hagman in Dallas, who he himself is a very spiritual person, but in his show, his character on his show is very stoic and businesslike. And so that's the side that he wants to promote. He's very selective about the side that he shows to the public so that it doesn't confuse people when they watch the show. Um, let's talk about Tina Fey a little bit. In the 1970s and on, um, she has really gone through lots of different meanings in the way that she's defined her public image and her character image, starting with her television work, her theatrical film work, and then the discourse of talk surrounding her. It's very important to hear she's in a commercial in 1995. It's hard to even recognize her. She has a very different kind of personality that's being portrayed there. And then here she is on TV and Saturday Night Live. She really defined herself and her television credentials. <coughs> and so she was working hard to get to define what the image was that she wanted us to see. And then she went through a period where when Tina, when uh, Sarah Palin was coming into the public eye a little bit more. Sarah, uh, Tina Fey couldn't help but look at her and think, oh my gosh, this is a perfect opportunity. Tina Fey had actually already left Saturday Night Live, but she came back for some special appearances because she couldn't resist doing impersonations of Sarah Palin. And some people wonder uh, how this affected the election, <laughs> you know, because here she is, talk about public discourse. The discourse of what Tina Fey was doing was affecting what Sarah Palin was doing and vice versa. And so how does this affect the public and how does this affect the image? And sometimes uh, when it, I think it said that Tina Fey, when she saw her, when her daughter saw Sarah Palin on television, she thought that was actually her own mother. So it's kind of interesting. And then look at this difference here. Now she has a very different kind of look. She's presenting a different image that she wants the world to see, which is a little bit more glamorous on Late Night with David Letterman. So stars go through these very specific choices that they make and how they're being perceived and how they can control that. And they work with a team of people to help them with all of those things. So the police and me of her, we talk about intellect. We talk about the third wave, third wave feminism that she brings to the screen, the ordinariness versus glamour. If you think about some of her films, she's trying to balance being an ordinary mom versus a glamorous person versus an intellect, all of those things. So there you go. That's the end of part two. You can watch some clips and let me know if you have any questions.